I'm very happy to be able to welcome all of you today to our event on the German NetSticky and its impact on the Digital Services Act in the European Union. My name is Alexandra Gies. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Green Group and I'm the Shadow Rapporteur for the DSA Own Initiative Report in IMCO and I'm co-chair co -chair of the Green Working Group on All Things Digital. I'm very happy to have a co-host today, as always in the digital platform events. And today it's not a fellow MEP from the European Parliament, but it's a member of the German Bundestag, Tabea Messner. It's okay. great to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sabia is the chair of the Greens Working Group on Net Politics and in charge of the NetsDG reforms for the Greens in Germany. So she would co moderate today. I would also like to introduce immediately our great speakers. Uh, one is Lisa Dittmar. She is Advocacy Officer for Internet Freedom and Reporters Without Borders. And she has been keeping a very close eye on the reforms and was in close touch with its policymakers. Welcome to you, Lisa. Great to have Thank you today. You very much. And the other speaker we have today, uh, I think she doesn't even need introduction, the Brussels bubble. It's Julia Reda, as you all see, and she has served as a member of the European Parliament until 19 and will always be remembered for a great battle for uh, a modern progressive copyright. <laughs> Then she was a fellow at Berkman Klein Center for Internet Society at Harvard University and at the Shuttleworth Foundation. And today she's project leader of Control C at the German NGO Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte. Very happy to have you, Julia. Thank you very much. Hello. So I would like to um, say a few words uh, as an introduction, because um, with the European Parliament's initiative report on the Digital Services Act being in the middle of its negotiation, we now really have started the process of reforming the e-commerce directive. And we all know that the Commission has been working on this for quite some time and is still planning to uh, launch its legislative proposal um, in December of this year. So um, this event today is also our way to inaugurate the German presidency, which has started July 1st. So this is the first time we do an all German event on the German law. But we all know that this law has uh, strongly influenced the views of the commission that is who is quite worried about um, the legislation on e-commerce being fragmented in 27 countries. And one of the laws that started doing, or the law that started doing that was the German network enforcement law. The other one is the French Avia law, which was recently struck down by the French Constitutional Court. And we will hear some more about that. But um, this is a very interesting issue. The NetsDG has been recent, recently reformed. Um, one reform was just passed, if I'm well informed. The other one, the other part of the reform will come in September. And um, therefore, it's a very interesting question how this will interact with the Digital Services Act. Because on the one hand, I think we are all um, of the opinion that we need a digital internal market in European Union with common rules that allow for a level playing field and the same legislation um, for all companies and especially for all users with strong users' rights. On the other hand, as an MEP, I really understand from a democratic point of view that single countries do want to have the power to legislate on things they perceive that, that are really going wrong. And that's something people are feeling, especially in Germany. We have uh, huge problems with hate speech, uh, especially. And we need to have the feeling we are able to do something about it. But what are we supposed to do? And what can we do in the member states? And what can we do in Europe? This is what we are going to look into today. Um, very shortly for who has never participated in this format, um, this is a moderated discussion, but it's supposed to be a very interactive format. So we start from a, with a few questions from our side, from me and Tabea to our to our speakers just to look into the issue and then we will give you the floor. You have different ways of asking questions. You can use the Q&A tool, um, which is at the bottom of your screen or according to the devices uh, you are using um, on, on the right side um, on the top of the screen. But I think you're, this is sort of the Brussels digital bubble, so you're probably all very familiar with Zoom instruments. 
And you can also raise your hand if you want to speak and we will give you the floor later. So if anything comes up you would like to comment on, you would like to ask the question, we have the possibility to give you the floor. So we will start for, with something like a half an hour, 40 minutes among us and you, you will have the possibility to um, participate in the discussion. The event is being uh, live streamed and will also be recorded and published on our website later. So please keep that in mind. If you if your voice is heard or um, you're seen or you say your name, um, this will be recorded. If you don't want your name to be mentioned and you don't want your voice to be heard, just use the key and A tool and don't ask questions which, for which I will give you the floor. Okay, so I think I can pass the floor to Tabea for the first question at this point. Tabea. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, Lisa, uh, you have intensively dealt with the reforms. Um, can you explain to the audience the timeline and most of all the content of the reforms? What is the new composed uh, compared to the old Nets DG? I'd like to very much. Thank you for having me. So first of all, the Nets DG has been around for roughly two and a half years now. It came into force in early 2018. And I think for some time amidst heavy criticism where at the time of the passing from all kinds of actors, including human rights advocates, uh, defenders of free speech and civil society at large, there's been some consent that there need to be further reforms to this law. It went ahead in, in a not foreseen way in Europe. Um, and uh, created a, a sort of uh, regulatory framework um, that's been untested. And so it's been a great experiment, really. Um, and uh, we've seen some updates uh, over the past year. Um, I think, uh, though everyone agreed that updates needed to happen, really this, these two parallel reforms that have, are now currently happening slash have happened um, are seen as a sort of slightly, in some parts, seen as a slightly populist do something move. Everyone agreed that an evaluation was needed of the NETS DG and its impact on society, its impact on the spread of um, illegal content online, on hate speech, um, and that based on this evaluation, uh, new reforms, new added legislation to the NETS DG uh, should be passed. However, this evaluation is still awaited. Um, it should reach the public by the end of this year, roughly in autumn. Uh, the deadline should pass. Um, but following on from the hor horrific attacks that we've seen last year in Germany, especially in Halle and Hanau, so this was the attack near Frankfurt, um, our federal government decided that really it was time to act now and to act fast. Though so everyone agrees, I think, um, on a need for further reforms, especially res with regards to the spread of um, illegitimate content, of illegal contents, um, and the effect of prosecution thereof, uh, there's been some debate about the proportionate means to do such a thing. So going back to the NETS DG, really what it did was to create a framework for the quick removal of content, not of its prosecution. So this is um, the big update we've seen with, this ref with these two reforms really this year. So to put it into context, we have one legislative reform uh, to combat a hate crime and right-wing extremism specifically, and we have a more general update to the NETS DG. Um, I'll briefly go into the main points. It's been confusing for everyone involved, I think. Um, there's some evidence with minor clashes, at least within the two draft laws, um, uh, that really there's th this fast track move to pass new legislation meant uh, that maybe some points might have missed out, might have been missed out um, in a rather complex debate. So the main point really was to move away from the pure removal of content to move towards the more effective prosecution of uh, illegal contents of the authors of illegal contents online. So what it does, and this is uh, within the now passed through the Bundesrat and the Parliament uh, law on hate crime and right-wing extremism, is it obliges platforms to not only remove content, but uh, to also 
uh, report those contents that it deems, in fact, illegal under um, certain German rights. Uh, this is national law. Um, uh, to pass it on to the Federal Criminal Police Office. They are a sort of central body that would then collect the information and uh, enable a faster and more efficient uh, prosecution of authors of illegal contents. What it also does is it means it's, a sh it's really a sharpening or a further promotion of this idea that platforms should be obliged um, to qualify what is illegal content and to deem illegal content uh, as such, to understand the context, to not only moderate content, but also to do this initial decision or this initial assessment on what could be considered an illegal content. And this is where civil society comes in and there's been heavy criticism in terms of data protection, in terms of the consequences of passing on this obligation or passing on this authority to do a predetermination of what is, can constitute illegal speech um, to the platforms themselves. And I think this is a key point. There's also been a couple, of, we can go into this into further detail, I think, at a later point, but um, to not only criticize, but also mention a few points, I think that largely have been welcome. Um, there's within the general update to the NetsDG, there's a provision for um, uh, improved transparency reports. So more information should be given out. Um, this is specifically also targeted and here it becomes interesting for the DSA, I think as well, um, to report on the use of algorithms, to report on the ability of uh, circles within science and academia to get a better understanding of the data and the use of algorithms within platforms. There's also been, and this has been a long time call from civil society and free speech advocates, um, a mechanism to reinstall or reinstate contents um, that were in fact deleted based on an, illeg an illegitimate uh, decision. So to appeal, users have an ability to appeal if their contents were removed and to um, have this rechecked basically and ideally then this has been a civil society claim, um, legal contents should be reinstated so as to uh, combat the effect of possible overblocking. And I think this is sort of the main points, but maybe we can go into this uh, in some further detail at a later point. Um, obviously, there are lots of points to consider anything from the transparency reports to effective means um, of appeal. Um, to the balance um, of interests and incentives that these laws set for the platforms, um, to the role of AI in the future of platform regulation and content moderation. Um, and yeah, I think it's been complicated for everyone involved. Uh, there was much dismay, I think, at the speed with which uh, at least the first law, so this is the law on right-wing extremism and hate speech was passed now even before the summer break. It was a very fast process. Um, and I think we can agree that some of the very valuable compromise proposals that there were also from the Greens um, have been neglected and should have been dealt with in more detail and should maybe have uh, held a bit more consideration within this process. Um, so we'll see where we head on from here. The general update to the NetsDG should be passed by Parliament um, after the summer break. A vote was scheduled but then postponed uh, in recent weeks and we'll see where it heads on from here but maybe so much from me for now thank you very much lisa that was a very helpful introduction um i have a question for tabea so what was the green point of view on that what were your main points of criticism or which were the points you also advocated and you're you supporting in this reform um i i muted you you have to unmute yourself i would like to ask everybody who's not speaking to mute themselves okay here you are tabea okay thank you very much uh, yeah, Lisa had, uh, has made a good introduction into this uh, field and she has mentioned already that this, we are in a process of discussing and passing amendments and there are these two amendment acts 
uh, aiming to improve the Nets DG. Uh, first of all, it's the act of, uh, to combat right-wing extremism and hate crime, and the other one is the act to amend the Network Enforcement Act, the Nets DG. Um, the act to combat right-wing extremism and hate crime already passed uh, in the German Bundestag just before the summer break and makes uh, amendments not only in the uh, uh, Netz DG, also in other laws like criminal laws as well. But uh, the act to amend the Network Enforcement Act is still in the leg legislation uh, process and therefore on hold until September on this year. Uh, recently, there was a public hearing of several experts in the leading committee on legal affairs and consumer rights, uh, consumer uh, protection. Most of them uh, were in favor of the amendment act, but some were critical, especially in regard to the protection of user rights and union law compliance. Um, the parliamentary group of the Greens um, in the Bundestag wants all platforms to take responsibility when it comes to illegal content. And we want to find an effective solution which does not harm civil rights, uh, like freedom of speech, uh, informational self-determination and uh, data protection, for example. Um, our main demands are, we need a comprehensive concept which includes, for example, a special task force for right-wing extremism. Uh, we have to install and improve central organized information centers where victims of hate crimes can easily report incidents. Um, the act to combat right-wing uh, extremism and hate crime ensures that uh, social media companies have to proactively report potential the criminal content on their platforms to law enforcement agencies, like Lisa mentioned. We criticized in particular the planned notification procedure to limit the data transfer from the platform to the Federal Criminal Police Office. We preferred a two-stage notification procedure. At the first stage, uh, the general facts about the case are sent anonymized to the Federal uh, Criminal Police Office. If they uh, decide that there is a re reasonable cause to open in investigation the personal data of the suspected perpetrator is transmitted at the second stage to the Federal uh, a criminal police office so it can further investigate the specific case. To prevent mass data retention, we suggested to shortly quick freeze the personal data. So um, after the investigations is finished, the federal criminal police office should in general delete the data they receive from the platforms. Um, the draft uh, to the act to amend the Network Enforcement Act, um, the current draft law to amend uh, the, the act uh, still suffers from uh, severe deficiencies. As uh, the European Commission already stated within the notification procedure for the act uh, to combat right-wing extremism and hate crime, uh, I am convinced that the NetzDG will still infringe upon European law. To be more specific, uh, it infringed upon Article 3 of the current e-commerce directive because it does not specifically say that it only regulates platforms which only operate in Germany. It ignores the country of origin principle the German government already reacted uh, to the uh, audio uh, visual uh, media services directive, which makes clear that video sharing platforms fall under the country of origin principle in article uh, three. Uh, this leads to the hilarious fact that YouTube and Facebook are currently not under the legal scope of the NetzDG. 
Uh, by the way, we had the same situation with the Medienstaatsvertrag, the Interstate Treaty on Media. Here too, the European Commission stated that this new German Treaty on Media infringes upon European law. But uh, on a side note, this, is, this treaty also includes useful proposals about the regulation of social media platforms and other platforms. It is, in my opinion, worth to have a look at it in order to gain some insight for the discussion around the Digital Services Act. Another criticism about the new Network Enforcement Act is the support protection of the rights of the users of social media platforms because they do not have a substantive legal claim to put back content which was deleted on false grounds. There is uh, too much responsibility left on the side of the platforms who follow their own private business and uh, political interests and are not impartial. Users are left alone to e efficiently enforce their rights, which can be hard when you have to sue a platform in court for your right to have your content to be uh, put back up. Yeah. So uh, we always called for a put back procedure for, uh, for this, uh, but this is, was unfortunately not yet implemented in the law. We also demand to put a platform in place where users can report their cases when they feel treated unfairly. We also want the data about such cases and the transparency reports by the platforms to be open for research purposes, for example, purposes. We demand the, that the German government has to ensure that the NetzDG is in compliance with the European Union law and that it is in tune with upcoming legislative uh, priorities of the EU, like the Digital Services Act and other similar projects. Maybe so far from my side. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Tadea. And um, you already said it needs to be compliant with the, with the future Digital Services Act. Um, maybe, Julia, you could comment a little bit on exactly that. So in, in which ways do you think these reforms can, could, should or should not influence all the policy making around the DSA? How do you see that? And then maybe I have a second question, but can I also repeat that later? I think you, I mean, you're working for, for an NGO called the Society for Freedom Rights. And I think here, fundamental rights are very strongly concerned. So if you want to make elaborate a little bit on that, we would be very happy to hear that. Yes, uh, I think those two questions are, are very closely connected because of course the EU would be very well advised to try to pass a Digital Services Act that is actually compatible with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Because uh, we have seen in the past, if the EU uh, passes legislation that is later found to be incompatible, like we had with the Data Retention Directive, that uh, it creates a very difficult situation where member states have already implemented the new legislation and then the directive is declared uh, incompatible with the charter at EU level that puts everybody in a, in a very difficult situation. So um, perhaps, uh, therefore, it's uh, useful to look at what happened in France with the Avia law as a cautionary tale, because in a lot of respects, the Avia law was a more extreme version of the NETS DG. So, um, uh, when the Avia law was declared unconstitutional in France, what the judges pointed to was uh, that the decision about uh, the illegality of content is made by the platform and not by a judge, and that um, the uh, requirement to delete content in a very short time, so usually 24 hours, but in some cases even within one hour, uh, would lead to a situation where the platforms would always delete when in doubt, which would violate uh, freedom of expression. Now, of course, um, the NETS DG is not exactly the same as the Avia law. And so in some respects, even though there also is this 24-hour deletion requirement, it is a softer requirement. Because one thing that I think is positive about the NETS DG in that respect is that it doesn't create a direct liability for damages in a case where 
a platform fails to delete something within 24 hours. Instead, um, in the NetsDG, there is only a sanction for a systematic failure to meet the requirements. So I think for the DSA, it's very important to keep the limited liability regime of the e-commerce directive intact. So platforms should not be liable if they fail to meet a specific obligation in a specific case, but rather we should be talking about uh, obligations that are at a higher level of abstraction, such as transparency obligations, um, and to sanction platforms if they systematically fail to meet those obligations. So um, I think when we're talking about the putback mechanism that is now on the table uh, in the context of the NETS DG. So how do you ensure uh, that users can make sure that content that was wrongfully deleted is actually put back? I think it's useful to also look at international examples. So in the United States, there already is such a, a counter notice procedure in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And uh, there we have found that quite often uh, it is not used. So even when legal content is deleted, very few users make use of the counter notice procedure. And there are different reasons for that. So one reason is that um, the damage is done in a way if something has been deleted. If you're participating in a com uh, conversation on a political topic, for example, and then a week later or even um, uh, months later, the content is reinstated, it's not particularly helpful for you. So that's why I think it is important to try to avoid the deletion of legal content in the first place, because even having a counter notice procedure is sometimes not very attractive for users. And the other element that I think is very important is to make sure that users don't have to fear using whatever counter notice procedure. So in the case of the US DMCA, there is the problem that using the counter notice procedure can create additional liability for the user. So people are afraid to make use of their right to have legal content put back. So that's something I think that we should be very uh, careful of when we're looking at the DSA. Um, one area that is perhaps helpful from the NETS DG uh, but needs some improvement are the transparency obligations. So I think it would be helpful for the DSA to look at how the transparency reporting requirements have worked under the NETS DG and how they have not worked. So for example, one thing that I found very interesting is that um, if you compare the German transparency reports of Facebook and Twitter, Facebook records drastically fewer cases of complaints under the NETS DG than Twitter does. And I don't think this is because people post fewer illegal materials on Facebook, but rather because Facebook deletes almost uh, anything on the basis of its terms of service. Uh, and um, this process is very intransparent. So one thing I think that would be helpful for the Digital Services Act is to require platforms to be more transparent about how they do content moderation in general, not just on the basis of the law, but on the basis of their terms of service, um, because users will only be able to go against an arbitrary uh, application of terms of service or something like that if they know how the content moderation is actually working. So requiring platforms to be more transparent about how they do content moderation I think would be a good lesson learned from the NETS DG when we're looking at European legislation. May I ask you some uh, questions? Uh, because uh, you mentioned um, that there are only so few people using the mechanism uh, to put it back. Um, uh, do you know why there are only so few people? What is the reason for that? Um, it's, of course, a little bit difficult uh, to know for sure, but there are some very interesting studies that are trying to figure out whether uh, providing better information to users could be helpful. I mean, uh, since this is the area of copyright law, one problem is that people don't exactly know 
whether they have the right to use something or not. So if people are unsure about uh, the legality of the content that they are uploading, then they might be less inclined to uh, assert their rights and to try to have content put back. Um, but I think the main reason is because it's not very helpful to have content reinstated days later. If you're participating in a conversation and something disappears, then the damage is already done. And even if uh, it is put back later, that might not necessarily uh, repair the damage from the perspective of the user. So therefore, I think it's very important to make sure that we don't create incentives for platforms to delete too much. Because once the content is deleted, even if you have the possibility to complain, the damage is already done in a way. May I ask another question? <laughs> because you, uh, you uh, talked about the terms of service. And uh, we discussed this uh, in Germany, if first the platform should check uh, if the content is, um, uh, is against the NetzDG and maybe then afterwards the terms of service. So what do you think about this discussion? I mean, I think it sidesteps a little bit the problem. So under the NetzDG, um, the platforms have to do these transparency reports and uh, at least the way that Facebook has implemented it, it does not report about uh, blocking decisions that have been done on the basis of the terms of service and therefore now there is this discussion should the platform be required to test the NetsDG first. But I think if the platforms were required to do transparency report about their content moderation on the basis of the terms of service, then you wouldn't really have uh, this problem. Because, I mean, I do think it is problematic to require a platform to decide whether a certain content violates the law or not. Normally, this is a decision that can only be made by a judge. So um, I'm not sure whether forcing platforms to always assess content on the basis of the law is not necessarily going to make the situation any easier because it is kind of a form of pro uh, privatized law enforcement if the, the platform then has to decide whether something violates the law or not. I think perhaps the better approach is to require transparency of how the platforms do content moderation and how many instances of deletion of content there are, regardless of whether it is done on the basis of the NetsDG or on the basis of the terms of service. Lisa, would you agree or, or what is your opinion about that? I think based on the work we do, we have contact with a lot of journalists internationally, especially outside of the European Union, who obviously regularly have their reports, especially critical ones, taken down based on state authority requests that are obviously dubious. Um, but, you know, in the absence of transparency, it's very hard to demand concrete answers from Facebook, Twitter and so on. Um, on which basis something is decided on. And we know from current cases internationally, from Vietnam to Egypt to Tunisia, um, that there's not enough transparency about the political pressure that these platforms are under, um, about the undue influence of state authorities on takedown decisions. Um, so really, I think in the long run, it is indeed necessary to have more transparency, to demand more transparency, based on community standards, on how content moderation is done. But generally, I think part of the debate should also be to talk about the conditions under which content moderation takes place. Because uh, content moderators, we all know these days, we don't really want to talk about it too much, but we all know um, are often working in precarious conditions. Um, the alternative, which I think a lot of current uh, EU legislation is asking for, is obviously automation which isn't really an alternative, whether we look at copyright or whether we look at the uh, current European uh, legislation or directive, draft directive on terrorist content, 
they all call for more automation. It seems the easy answer. It seems a nice way out from nasty working conditions for people who have to look at, well, the dirt of the internet. Um, but it's not really an answer because all, all of these decisions are complicated ones. It's a complicated adjudication of what is, what constitutes incitement to violence, what constitutes um, illegal speech. And these decisions shouldn't, should neither be taken by filters who can't really make legitimate decisions, who can't really understand the context um, of a post, neither should they be made within, you know, roughly 30 seconds to two minutes, which is the time frame under which content, most content moderation takes place. So we are asking these platforms um, to make important decisions and to make an important contribution to public debate, which these days to a large uh, part takes place on these platforms. So yes, I think largely asking for more transparency, asking um, for more explanations of how these platforms operate definitely is a f an important first step. Yeah, I would like to come back in. Thank you for your very precious contributions. And I think um, what you just mentioned, Lisa, is a very important point that often gets lost in the whole debate. And um, that's interesting because it's not a EU competence, labor law. But um, concerning these global platforms and labor conditions in many European countries, it would be very interesting to um, to work on that. We are currently trying with the S&D Rapporteur in the lead in our report to get at least a provision into the IMCO report on the fact that uh, workers need to be improved when they're concerned by algorithms, artificial intelligence within the DSA. And even that is proving sort of difficult. I hope we succeed, but um, it's considered out of scope actually. Um, so, but I think we, we really have, need to keep an eye on that. That's a very important point. I'm happy to contribute that in this report we are writing, we are already asking for very differentiated, standardized reports on takedowns, on content moderation. So I think the concerns you mentioned previously about the comparability, for example, of reports between different companies and, um, <clears throat> and content taken down on the basis on legislation rather than on the basis of terms of services also. We would like this to be specified in the reports and I think um, that will improve the situation or at least be an important contribution. I, I would like to take one question. I have lots more, but I would like to start uh, questions from the audience and I would like to encourage the audience to ask more questions and also to raise um, their hands if they want to come in the debate. I have a few written questions, but if you want to come in, just raise your hand as participant and I can call you. So the first question that came in was, um, Lisa, thanks for your very clear explanation. That was right after your intervention. Could you clarify what are the criteria to define what constitu constitutes platforms that must obey the next DG? So I think which, which platforms are, um, are regulated under the next DG? And because Tabea also made some very interesting remarks on that on YouTube being out of scope, if I understood that correctly. So I think that's interesting to go back to Lisa, you have the floor. I think that's a really interesting debate, especially in Germany, because what falls under this law is actually a very limited number of platforms. And it's a speci specifically a very limited number of platforms if you look at the original aim of the law, which is to combat hate speech. Obviously, the obvious ones are Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And within Germany, indeed, um, what falls under this is large platforms with at least 2 million users. That's one you know, specific number they had to set apparently at some point to um, yeah, make a decision on uh, the market dominance of platforms. It also only includes platforms that are not journalistic. It in only includes platforms that are, um, at RSF, we like to say information intermediaries. I'm aware that that's also not um, an easy to understand term, but basically this is about platforms that enable the sharing of third party content and posts. Um, but yeah, it's a very limited number and it's specifically a very limited number because Facebook and Twitter are no longer necessarily the main platforms where hate speech and illegal content is shared. And I think this has been a large part of the debate that really we know that especially the attacks that we're talking about in, during the last year in Germany were inspired in large parts by the interconnection of terrorist groups and extremist groups on platforms that are not 
publicly available in this way or that are gaming platforms, platforms like 4chan, 8chan, some of the well-known um, ones within the gaming scene, but also um, private channels on messaging services. So this is where it gets even more complicated because if we talk about Telegram groups or WhatsApp groups, um, there's good reasons that we want to protect messaging services. And there are good reasons that we want to protect encrypted communication between people. And if anything, we're very worried about some of the voices coming out of the EU currently um, that uh, are really an attack on encryption policies and an encryption technology. Um, I don't think that can be the answer, but it's becoming increasingly complicated to uh, set the, to understand the differences between obvious social media platforms uh, such as Facebook and Twitter, and semi-public spaces such as Telegram channels or groups that have hundreds of thousands of members. Um, and I think those will be interesting debates to be had. Um, and I do think within the DSA, this, um, this purview should be dealt with again and should be reopened, the whole debate on who should fall under this law. Um, and yes, again, we need to talk about uh, content moderation versus um, or community standards versus national or European laws. Um, what's clear to us is that we need more independent oversight, that this should be neither left completely to the platforms, nor should states get undue influence over what constitutes hate speech. And um, as we see from the current German amendment, um, it should also not be the federal criminal uh, police office who decides on the limits of free speech um, or who can you know s uh, determine an initial suspicion of illegal um, acts this is highly problematic and it becomes even more complicated if we look at states uh, that are not quite so keen on democratic principles so the eu will set an important example and we know from the nets dg and its impact on authoritarian uh, states and their internet legislation that we should be very careful with what we do here and that the well mechanisms that we come up with um, will work or should at least not have more collateral damage in states that are less democratic. Even in the EU we know that democratic principles are under attack. Um, so this is not a self-evident thing to, um, to consider, um, but we should definitely have more debates about those issues. I if I could add to that last point, because I think it's extremely important. Uh, one thing that a lot of Germans don't know about is that uh, authoritarian countries around the world that have passed internet censorship laws in the last couple of years have been explicitly referring to the NetsDG as a model. So sometimes this may have been sort of done unfairly because the specific legislation that they were passing was of course not the same as the NetsDG, but it's uh, nevertheless something that we should be keenly aware of when we are talking about the Digital Services Act, that it will be extremely difficult to argue towards other countries that the kinds of legislation that we are passing in Europe should not be available to other countries. So I think this is very important um, to keep in mind that um, uh, not, well, the, the intentions may not always be how the law is perceived in other places. And uh, regarding the point about the police, I think it's very important to highlight that uh, it has come to light in uh, recent investigations about far-right networks in Germany that have been uh, committing acts of right-wing terrorism or that have been threatening um, people that uh, they were sometimes getting information about their victims from the police. Uh, that, uh, of course, means if the changes to the NetsDG in Germany now give more power to the police to collect data, even on people who haven't committed any crimes, that have simply been forwarded by the platforms uh, on the basis that there is a suspicion that content might be illegal. This means that um, the German Federal Police Office and also the Secret Services can start collecting a lot of data about individuals that aren't actually um, specifically uh, suspected of having committed a crime. And I think that is very dangerous 
from uh, a privacy perspective, especially considering that there are concerns about right-wing um, uh, extremism within the ranks of the German police. Yeah, Tabea, do you want to add on that or can we pass to the next, proceed with the next question? Well, it's a thin line, I think, <laughs> between, uh, um, yeah, going, um, or trying to, to, uh, to combat um, criminal, um, yeah, and on the other side, uh, to protect the freedom of speech. And um, even in Germany, not only in the other countries, but it's also, um, yeah, it's a thin line and regulation is not very easy in this part. And we discussed that already with the youth media protection, for example, it's uh, the same. We have experience with that, um, but now it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's more difficult because you have these uh, different uh, services, uh, you have these different platforms. Um, and I know also there are so many um, groups in Signal, for example, or Telegram, um, who, who are on the very right wing. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I think we still, we have to discuss what is the right um, regulation maybe for that do we need regulation and um, what, what can it be yeah but um, I think the next thing is maybe not the right um, the right law for that well I'm, I'm afraid the Digital Services Act will have to address that issue so <laughs> I, I think so too yeah <laughs> that very difficult discussion and I totally agree with you that it's, it's a it's a thin line because I, I totally agree with what Julia and Lisa said on the other hand, I know a lot of people who don't have freedom of expression anymore because they are targeted by hate speech massively. And so they can't go online, they can't have a Twitter account, um, a Facebook account, they can't even go to talk shows on television and, and as experts on their meta, which they might be teaching in university or researching um, be because of the threats they receive, they and especially their families. And when you have small children, uh, you are quite sensitive to those kinds of threats. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's freedom of expression on both sides and it's fundamental rights on both sides. And that makes it so extremely difficult to figure out what the right means are. Um, I would like to, I, I have so many questions of my own, but I, I'll take a few more questions from the audience. And then there's one from the audience that just got upvoted. Great. I, I'm very lucky because that was the question I was, I always wanted, I, I also wanted to ask. And the question is, um, why do we always only talk about a legal speech as such, which focuses on what the users do? We should address what the platforms do, which is often promoting and amplifying a legal speech because it brings more clicks and engagement, which translates into advertising revenue. And I would like to add on that because this is exactly my point in this whole issue. And this is the point I feel has not been taken on board on, in the report um, we've been working on. And I think it's, it's not being understood even in the bubble. Um, and the question is, don't we rather need transparency of decision-making and algorithms, not only for automated content, uh, content recognition systems, as is foreseen in the NetsDG, if I understand that correctly, but also for recommender systems? Because, I mean, the recommender systems, according to me, are really the problem because, um, for example, there was a recent article in the Wall Street Journal that says that 65% of the members of um, extreme right um, Facebook groups were directed to those groups by Facebook recommender systems. And I mean, there's a lot of research on YouTube as well. So what I would like to focus on are those systems and transparency on those systems. So what do you think about that? Um, can I respond to that? Yeah, I, I would go a step further, actually, and say that we would need much stricter regulation of targeted advertising, because this is the business model of uh, platforms. And ultimately, this is the reason why the recommendation algorithms work the way they do. I mean, um, I think transparency can only go so far. And I'm not sure if it's possible for a user to fully understand why they were shown certain content, even if the 
algorithms are made more transparent, whatever that means uh, in a machine learning context. But I think it's really a shame that the negotiations on the e-privacy regulation have stalled because they were about um, more strictly limiting what platforms are allowed to do in terms of targeted advertising. And I think this debate will urgently need to be picked up again in the Digital Services Act, because at the end of the day, platforms have an incentive to optimize the user experience for what the advertisers want and not what the users want. Because uh, if uh, certain content is maybe engaging and more people click on it because it's perhaps not illegal, but it's uh, uh, including conspiracy theories or something like that, that actually benefits the advertisers. So um, there are some innovative uh, proposals uh, also coming from civil society around forcing uh, those larger platforms to allow the users to configure the recommendation algorithms themselves. So to offer an open programming interface that would allow a third party to change what you see on Facebook or on Twitter and uh, to put the users back in charge of what they want to see. So for example, personally, I find it quite useful to be able to see a chronological timeline on Twitter. I may not want the recommendation algorithm to tell me what to look at next, and the same might apply to the recommendation algorithms on YouTube or Facebook. And perhaps that way, uh, if you require uh, these open programming interface, there can even be a competition over different recommendation algorithms that users actually want rather than what advertisers want. I'm afraid Germany does not force the e-privacy, <laughs> but um, uh, let me uh, tell you about the uh, committee uh, of inquiry on artificial intelligence. I'm also a member of that committee and we discuss that uh, right now and um, there is the uh, subcommittee um, uh, media and social media platforms concerning uh, artificial intelligence. So um, the, the question we didn't discuss uh, with the act uh, to combat right wing extremism and hate crime or the netsting, it's only discussed in this uh, committee. Um, and uh, this is where I've been proposing such transparency obligations for recommendation systems that you have uh, mentioned that you have mentioned because uh, the decision of an algorithm about what kind of media people see on their platforms can change democracy as whole so um, right now we are finalizing uh, the report for the subcommittee on the impact of artificial intelligence on media and social media platforms but the problem is that experience and uh, years on such committees have shown that the German government seldom uses the findings from these reports. Um, so we still have to implement these transparency rules in proper regulation, for example, in the EU. I think maybe to add just to add to this, because I fully agree with what Julia said. Sorry, always nice to have a debate with uh, lots of opponent uh, critical statements, but unfortunately, I think that's maybe the frustrating part. I think civil society and a lot of political actors for a long time have agreed that the business model itself is an issue. You said earlier on that labor laws aren't exactly the usual focus you'd expect from Reporters Without Borders. And so competition law definitely also doesn't usually fall uh, within the realm of our work, but really the fragmentation of the political debate and the fragmentation of the different levels at which written legislation is currently happening and the very narrow focus that each law usually takes um, is a problem because, you know, we know that internet legislation is roughly 20 years behind of what's been happening and tech moves fast and I think um, it doesn't speak well for us if Mark Zuckerberg gives us recommendations for how to regulate his network 
we all agree on that. And um, it's definitely high time that the DSA takes a more holistic approach of anything and that these things are dealt with together because you can't look at algorithms without also looking at the business model. You can't treat social media without looking at where it comes from and where the money goes to. Um, so this is, these are critical debates to have, definitely, from a Reporters Without Borders perspective, because I'm also seeing questions here on where the attention of users is directed at. We're definitely looking at the question of, um, well, what are we meant to look at and what are we drawn to, to look at? Obviously, Reporters Without Borders cares a lot about the infodemic problem and the spread of um, false information and um, all of those issues. But I think a large part is indeed giving users more control, starting with an understanding of what algorithms do and how they interact with us, because we don't even have the science to base our policies on, and that's dangerous territory, I think. No one really gets the necessary access to understand how algorithms are trained to interact with us and to understand our decisions and then to manipulate our decisions. And I think you have to say it as hard as it is. Um, and so a first step would be to better understand these systems and to better understand how they interact with our thinking and our personal choices. A second step is to give more transparency to users about how their data is used and abused um, and how it's sold on. So all of these issues come in. Um, and then also giving users understandable choices for what they can do and to also deny algorithmic decision making within their feeds, for example. Um, I think those are all critical points. So, yeah. So there's one comment uh, uh, I would like to read. Addressing targeting advertising is not enough even with completely neutral advertising platforms would still push content that is more engaging. User control over algorithm is a great idea, but what should be the default? What should it be uh, optimized towards? Do you have I an think, idea for that? <laughs> I think that's a difficult question. I mean, I understand uh, the problem that most users will not change the default settings. So one thing that I think could help with that would be to um, allow third parties to create alternative user interfaces that can then compete with each other because the vast majority of users will not be able to kind of, you know, uh, program their own recommendation algorithm. That's certainly not realistic. I think in terms of the default, personally, I can't think of any default that would make sense other than chronological. I mean, this is kind of where Twitter and Facebook started would be that um, you see content that is coming from your contacts within the, so uh, the social network and that um, by default, the, this content used to be chronologically ordered. But that would, of course, be a relatively strong legislative intervention. I think it would already be a really good step in the, in the right direction to force platforms of a certain size to offer these open programming interfaces in order for third parties, which could be NGOs, could be companies, to um, offer users an alternative user experience that they would be able to choose from. Because, I mean, I completely agree that most users would not necessarily be able to change the defaults in a way that uh, suits their needs perfectly. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think that as well. I think we need some kind of solution for, for the great majority of people who just want to use the platforms without thinking too much about it. It was just like, some, some exchange and some information without putting too much thought in that. I would like to, to step out just for a second out of the moderator role and give you an update on what's going on in Parliament and, and in the Commission, um, because you touched a few questions that we've been discussing as well and that you might want that information. Um, for example, on competition, Lisa, you said we need a more comprehensive view of lawmaking in order to tackle different aspects at the same time, even if they fall under different committees or ministries or whatever. 
And um, the commission has put a lot of thought in that. And um, I think the, the current state of affairs is that there will be a second uh, legislative proposal um, sort of attached to the DSA, but um, standalone um, on competition issues. Um, in the digital sphere that would tackle all those competition issues linked to the to the great platforms and within the DSA we are discussing um, particular obligations for uh, systemic platforms or dominant platforms. I mean there's a lot of discussion going on around um, the definitions as well but there will be the more fundamental rights and e-commerce and users rights um, related aspects practically in one package and then the competition issues in the other package. And they have to go hand in hand um, to be effective, I think. So that's, that's being addressed. On the, um, the different recommendation mechanisms, um, we suggested an amendment um, on unbundling of um, the platforms and the content curation, basically, um, which is basically what, what you were suggesting, Julia, where users could choose to be on one platform, for example, on Facebook, but not use the Facebook recommendation system, but um, something else of their choice, which an NGO or another company could offer according to different criteria. Um, and I think that would have been a great opportunity to give users more choice and also to open up the market as well because we're the internal market committee so we are supposed to make sure there's a good functioning internal market and competition and consumer protection and that was um that was rejected by the other parties i don't know why i haven't really understood i think maybe the idea wasn't quite understood or i mean there is the possibility the very remote possibility that the huge platforms did a lot of lobbying i wouldn't um, know that might did you did you propose it for all platforms or just for the large ones because perhaps that would be a milder ones, yeah was the ones considered systemic i mean i could i could see where why people might think this is too harsh if it applied to small platforms because of course there should be the possibility to have an easy market entry but for the really large ones like facebook i really don't see a problem i think it would actually help competition rather than hinder it yeah what we do have in the report is um, a lot of transparency provisions on ad tech and the possibility uh, not even to opt out, but to opt in especially. Um, so you have to opt in if you, if you want it. Um, I think that's what's pretty good. The interesting thing was that in the meantime, the plenary voted uh, a complete ban of micro-targeting in a resolution on competition which I think in the first days sort of passed unnoticed because um, the colleagues from the Economic Affairs Committee uh, were in charge of that and not the digital, digital people. So we basically voted on this very large framework. And there was this one line on a ban on micro-targeting in there, which in the beginning we hadn't even noticed. So actually, currently, there is a parliament position on a ban um, of micro-targeting, which I think is interesting, but I'm not sure it's going to hold up if that issue is really going to be at the center of the debate. So just on what's going on in parliament, but um, I still would like to see a very strong um, obligations on for transparency um, of the algorithms and the whole decision-making process. And this is what we have in turn um, in the report on ethical aspects of um, artificial intelligence that was voted in the IMCO committee um, the day before yesterday. So we have to look into how this is going to link to the Digital Services Act as well. And that's going to be a very interesting issue too. I would like to come back to a question from the audience and add a little bit to that. Um, the question is pretty long, but it's about supervision and oversight. And then we could come back also to the question of European oversight and what should it should look like. But I'm going to read out the question. And thanks to the audience for the question. At the expert hearing in the Bundestag on the NetzDG, the problem was raised that there are conflicting views on responsibility for the supervision of platforms in Germany. Is the supervision of platforms and their content the task of the media supervision of the federal states or the task of the telecommunication supervisory authorities or other federal authorities? So that's very German. <laughs> um, which authorities should control the work of the platforms and the content 
distributed through them. In particular, the content which is not already punishable, but is nevertheless distributed illegally. For example, because it doesn't comply with the law on the protection of minors or consumer protection. That looks like a question to Tabea, who's probably an expert on that. Not sure um, if anybody else wants to answer. But I would like to, um, to use this um, opportunity to also ask to the others the question, um, what kind of European oversight do you think there should be for the Digital Services Act? This is more the German part of the question, but I would like to, to add the European as, is, uh, aspect that I think Lisa mentioned in her introductory remarks, and that is obviously very important for us. But I would like to give first the floor to Tabea, because I think you are the one who understands the complete the complex proceedings of German law on, on media and digital. And the it's very complicated because in Germany we, we have federal uh, competence in media. Yeah? Uh, so uh, the states are responsible for um, the, the content um, and regulation and they have also authorities but they are not very powerful. Um, and now they have, um, with the NetzDG, um, parallel stru structures of authorities, like the Bundesamt for, Justi uh, for Justice. Um, and uh, that is one problem that um, there are so many actors and they don't really work together. So um, I always uh, say we should have a consistent and co coherent um, regulation and also uh, a work together of these um, different uh, institutions. And for example, um, the Landesmedienanstalten, which are responsible um, of, yeah, which is the authority on the federal um, level, they have also this uh, group, this uh, how is it in, in uh, I'm looking for the word in, uh, in, uh, in English, the Erga, what is, um, what is the Erga in, uh, in English? Do you know that, Alexandra? I think it's the, I, I don't know the exact name, but it's, it's European Regulators Group of Audiovisual audio Media Services, I think. <laughs> so, uh, not many people know this this um, uh, this European regulators group, but um, I think maybe they should get more power uh, also to uh, to act and to force our uh, platforms maybe, or we need another agency on European level. Who wants to come in on the on the question on the European agency? There is an extensive debate going on on that in the Parliament. Any opinions, Julia, Lisa? Well, I think having a European level oversight uh, might contribute to a more uniform application because I mean, um, Tabea mentioned earlier the, the controversy around uh, the country of origin principle. I mean, I think on the one hand, it's a, a, an important principle in order to ensure also that it's uh, uh, relatively easy for new platforms to enter the market and to know what rules they have to comply with. And perhaps a European oversight body can contribute uh, to a uniform application of the law in, in this environment. So um, I think it's, it's definitely worth considering this option, but I also have to say that I'm not uh, an expert on the different um, oversight bodies at the uh, state level and federal level in Germany and then um, their European coordination. I think that's one point that even in Germany, experts don't really see through the multiple levels of authority and when <laughs> Who, who and which applies. I think there's roughly four authorities who can currently uh, decide or have an impact on uh, the assessment of legality of content. So there are also some co-regulatory approaches. There are some media institutions that uh, can, can have themselves certified to also play a role um, 
within this field basically so it gets ever more complicated and then you have you know uh, attempts by facebook and so on themselves to establish some sort of oversight um the facebook oversight committee or the board which will take up its work soon um is certainly one part of that um what we liked about that approach at least was that for the first time i think it includes experts on freedom of speech and renowned journalists um freedom you know fighters for defenders of freedom of speech and so on um with a, a sort of global view of the issues at hand so that's at least positive but it's clear that it can neither be solely upon platforms to set themselves their own guidelines basically so from an rsf view it seems important to have some form of uh, independent oversight that not only um, gets to decide on critical cases um, of content moderation, but that really have an impact on setting guidelines on all of these issues. So to, to help develop guidelines on a more ethical um, use of data analysis uh, on algorithms and so on. And to us, it seems important to have civil society involved in that, obviously, um, and to have you know, journalists, lawyers, um, from all kinds of perspectives involved in this process. Um, it, it seems clear that we will always have parallel structures. It seems important to me that uh, as the final remedy, users can actually go to court um, and appeal to national law and get a judge to make these really important decisions. Um, that should be an option. But as a first um, sort of standard, I think it's important to have some sort of independent oversight body um, to get involved in all of these matters. And it should happen on a European level, that much seems clear, because to stand up to these platforms um, and to get proper interest from, their, from them and their representatives, I'm afraid, um, it will have to happen on a supranational level. And um, especially looking at What's happening in some parts of Eastern Europe, I think it's also from a democratic safeguard point of view, um, it should be in our interest to have a European answer and to have a European body um, to, to represent users in general. Um, I, have, I would like to jump in here. I have more questions from the audience, and, but we still have some time. Um, I have a question that's really related to what you just said. Um, I'm, I'm a strong advocate of European oversight with enforcement powers, because I think a law is only good if you can enforce it. And we are seeing with, with GDPR that we have great legislation and it's doing good things, but it's, if it were enforced as it should be, it would be even better and we might not have some of the problems we are, we are experiencing. So I'm a total advocate of European oversight, a European agency, but that doesn't seem to be the political majority at the moment. I think we need to discuss this further. Um, while I think there should be a European board or agency with enforcement powers, I also think we should have some kind, an, another civil society organ to have a look at what's happening. And um, some have ventilated the idea that I've been taking up in Europe because I think it's great of social media councils. And David Kay has talked about that the UN Rapporteur for Freedom of Speech and Marie de Schacker on the European side, the Transatlantic Working Group. And I think it's a great idea that we should really work on more um, in, in Europe. And I see it made up not of representative uh, of the companies like the German press councils or some other countries that have press councils as well, but really a civil society, the people you mentioned before, lawyers, journalists, experts of freedom of speech, but also representatives of the groups that are targeted by hate speech, for example, women's organizations, anti-racism organizations. I mean, let's not forget that the people that are targeted by hate speech and losing their freedom of expression are the same people who can't really raise their voice in the normal debate and who are targeted by racism, for example, in the police, as we are seeing in the Black Lives Matters discussion. Um, so I would really like to, um, I mean, to hear your view. Could you envisage social media councils made up by civil society to look into the practices, to um, highlight them, to um, promote a public debate on that? obviously combined with clear transparency 
obligations in order to know what we're actually talking about and not just to comment anecdotes, but to have some data to, to work on, then to formulate policy recommendations. So we would have the companies on one side, the judicial system, the political system, and civil society organizations that make up social media councils or single people. So it's sort of a four pillar system that I think is very interesting, especially in those countries, like you mentioned, the Eastern Europe, some Eastern Europe countries, I mean, let's say Hungary, for example, or Poland, where we have that issue. Do you think that that would be something we should look into? Is that interesting? Especially, you know, hearing from Facebook of the Oversight Council that they sort of privatize not only legislation, not only lawmaking, but also the ethical aspects of it and the civil society and they take all into the companies. And I think that's extremely, extremely worrying for democratic societies and we should absolutely not accept it, but have a good alternative. So maybe- yeah. Just a short I, answer because I have more questions from the audience, but that was something that's really important for me. I basically agree with you. And just to highlight how important it is that those civil society groups would have uh, transparency rights towards the platforms is that uh, the Facebook Advisory Council is now dealing with questions of whether content should be deleted or not. But um, increasingly, concerns are not about uh, whether something is deleted, but about who gets to see it. And um, uh, there are always suspicions that companies are downgrading certain content. So for example, on YouTube, after something was wrongfully blocked by Content ID, let's say, you can have it reinstated under certain circumstances, but there are suspicions that the algorithm is punishing this content and is not showing it to as many people anymore. Um, and uh, these concerns are even more uh, rampant on TikTok, for example, where there was even some press reporting about uh, TikTok uh, asking people to downgrade uh, specific content, for example, from the LGBT community or uh, um, other marginalized groups. But uh, if you don't have access to that information about which content gets downranked, then it is a lot more difficult for such, a, let's say, a civil society, social media oversight body to do its job. So I think the information provision rights are extremely important for the independent oversight to be able to work. If you don't know that certain content is being downranked, it's very difficult to discuss whether it's appropriate or not. I think it's uh, it's a good idea because in Germany we we discussed that um, for many years uh, the media regulation the media policy um, is in the uh, in the in the states um, so the minister presidenten uh, the presidents of the states uh, they uh, discuss it and they decide of course it goes to the state parliaments also, but every regulation yeah, is made up in the back rooms of the Staatskanzlei in Germany. So that's why we discuss all the time, how can we have um, uh, more transparency and another level on um, regulation and uh, discussion, public discussion about that. For example, in, uh, in Great Britain, they have the Ofcom which is also a board um, with experts, um, not, only, um, not only politicians, there are also uh, scientists. Uh, I don't know if there are so many uh, NGOs, but of course there are people who can apply for um, being member of this board from the civil society. So um, I think we need more discussion, public discussion about media and about what what it does what, what how platforms work how um how you are influenced manipulated or whatever and um what is the best way to do so i think something like kind of agency or uh, board or um yeah with with a lot of um civil rights uh, organization is very important for the future, I think, because we don't know what kind of models, uh, business models come up, uh, what, what we will have for um, 
um, for challenges and also for um, herausforderungen. Um, yeah. challenges. Sorry. Challenges. Sorry, my, my English is not so good. <laughs> no problem. Great. Okay, I'd like to take some more questions from the audience because we have to stop a few minutes before two o'clock sharp because um, some of us have other commitments and there's Chancellor Merkel speaking in the plenary. Um, so um, there are two questions I would like to take together. Um, one says the Net DG has been described as a terms of services enforcement act. How should the DSA be drafted to prevent platforms from retreating into the terms of services, which set thresholds for illegality much lower, which is a very um, relevant question we are also dealing with. And then I would like to add a second question that's a little bit different. It's more from a, from a democratic um, theory of, of democracy point of view, but it's also a very basic question sort of related to that one. And that's, it says, there's a basic democratic principle that lawmaking powers and judicial powers should not be in the same hands. How do we avoid the private platforms that are central for the access to information and discussions be both the main free speech lawmaker through their terms of services, so that's how it reconnects to the previous question, and the main judges of the content they host? And this is one of the really crucial questions, I think, for the Digital Services Act. Um, how would you comment on that? I don't know, Julia, Julia? Lisa? Sure. Um, so I would say, first of all, to avoid that everything is done on the basis of the terms of service, we should drop the negotiations on the terrorism regulation because I think uh, it, this is a piece of legislation that really goes in completely the wrong direction, not just um, encouraging platforms to use their terms of service, but even helping platforms to enforce their terms of service. So privately made rules with public entities, which I think is really uh, the wrong approach. I think one way that you can uh, try to influence uh, in the other direction is to make sure that users have procedural rights when it comes to deletions on the basis of terms of service. So um, that I think would be helpful as, as a step to somewhat counter that trend. And at the end of the day, I think we have to um, not be complacent and we have to be honest about the fact that at the end of the day, there are going to be a lot of cases that are not obviously infringing or not infringing. And at the end of the day, the decision over the legality of content has to be made by a judge. And therefore, we should also look at other means of uh, supporting groups, for example, that are, that are targets of hate speech online. So supporting counter speech initiatives um, and uh, things like that. And also um, perhaps the education among law enforcement around issues such as uh, gender-based hate speech uh, and gender-based violence. Because um, I don't think that simply putting platforms in the position of being the, the judge uh, over what is legal or what is illegal is going to solve the problem that women have difficulty participating in public debate because of all the, um, the sexism that uh, they are exposed to online. I think that is more of a societal issue that we have to uh, uh, really tackle holistically and also tackle within our uh, well, uh, tackle any kinds of discriminations that are that are inherent in our law enforcement system. So, not look at uh, the Digital Services Act primarily through a lens of how can we make sure that crime doesn't happen on the internet. I think that is uh, an unrealistic ambition, and it could also go in the wrong direction. Uh, for example, if uh, if we are talking about things like um, encryption, I think the, the benefits for uh, journalists, for fundamental rights defenders and people standing up to authoritarian regimes worldwide of being able to communicate uh, through encrypted and safe means are so much bigger than any kind of uh, concerns around, uh, let's say, conspiracy theory groups on Telegram, that it's really, really important that we 
don't uh, go too far in, in the uh, direction that out of fear over crime on the internet, we end up uh, exposing fundamental rights defenders uh, to uh, oppression. Thank you. Anybody else on the terms of services, Lisa? I can see that we're running out of time, so I'll keep it very brief. But yes, basically, I think the ideal here is that uh, the large platforms are held to international human rights standards and that they are held to international standards of free speech, because currently they're finding it way too easy, especially in lesser democratic states worldwide, to refer to national laws um, as the actual problem and not their obligation to uphold um, well their democratic obligations to us as users. Um, and I think, you know, fundamentally, I think the tide has turned and we're now currently mostly talking about um, all of these issues and they are very real changes, challenges, um, hate speech and extremist content. But by and large, what it comes down to is that Facebook and all of these platforms, despite all the challenges, have created spaces of debate and free speech that are massively important and that add to our world and we should preserve that bit and we should definitely hold them to account to preserve this ideal rather than work out how to sanitize our internet um, so yeah if you want a really really quick answer i think it comes down to a good balance on that side um, and sometimes that will mean i think putting up with some content that we don't like to see um, but yeah, I think we've touched on a lot of the cornerstones of what needs to be improved from well, the business models to um, how to deal with algorithmic decision making of the future. So yeah, lots to talk about still. Um, that, that would have been a perfect conclusion, but I have one more question that's really interesting. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, very quick, just a very quick round of answers. Um, tackling the business model, someone suggests that the platforms should be forced to send users information about how much revenue their data generated to incite more choice and more user-focused alternatives. Do you think such measures, measures could be included in future legislation and help enforce Nets DG reforms? Any opinions of that? Should the platforms tell users how much money they're making with their data? I think that's a really... I think. I think that's a bad idea. I think it's not helpful to talk about data as a kind of an individualized monetary resource. I think that we had that discussion in the context of the GDPR and we found that data is not property, it's not a commodity, but rather data protection is a fundamental right. So I don't think that approach is very helpful. Anybody else? I mean, I've seen lots of attempts to make people just, I think the idea is to make people aware of what's happening, of the business model and how we should talk about this. I mean, someone called this a fringe topic we're talking about today. It's not. It, it goes back to how we communicate in the modern age and how politics is shaped. So this, these are fundamental debates that people should be much more aware about and should have debates at their kitchen tables about. Um, uh, but yes, again, uh, we can't live in a world where suddenly everyone finds it okay that if there's the right price to selling your data, it, it'll work out. We need to have a, a much more general debate about um, whether this is ethical at all and how business models uh, can work out and how Facebook can sustain itself um, in a way that does not mean we all com commodify ourselves and our thoughts and our debates. Great. I think Tabea wants to answer, but I have a different question for you, where that is also very important. So you have the last word. Um, has the NetsDG had a positive effect in terms of less hate speech online? And this is what we all want to know, really. Does, does, does these laws work or not? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, the, the problem is there's not so much research about that. And uh, um, the reports are not um, the same size, so you cannot really compare it. Um, I think it's, uh, it does not have this effect uh, right now. I don't know if the others have uh, other experiences or do you know any studies about that? I don't know, <laughs> but I think um, no, not really. And that is the problem. Um, we have this regulation. Um, but um, there are still so many problems with it um, that so many people, for example, don't uh, complain about that or don't go this pro 
procedure because it's so complicated and stuff like that. So first of all, I think when we have the amendments and the new law, maybe then we have more um, reports we can re compare, we can, we, maybe we have more um, studies about that because it's only two and a half years now, I think. Yeah, so um, it, it needs a little more time to see how effective uh, this, this law really is. Great. And uh, then maybe, maybe we can uh, put these experiences into the discussion about the Digital Services Act. <laughs> Exactly, that's what I was hoping to do. <laughs> and I, I think we still have a lot of questions um, and I'm, I'm uh, re really sad we cannot answer all of them, but yeah. we will take them into our discussion. I think we will still um, be in uh, close contact about the Digital Services Act and uh, we will uh, join you um, in this process because then we also have to um, implement it in, in national law. So it's very important to be uh, very alert uh, in mm. the discussion right now. Well, it's probably going to be a regulation, so it's going to be law directly, okay. but we'll have to deal with it. So yeah, we will, we will stay in close touch uh, and not only with the German Greens, but obviously with all of you, with Julia, with Lisa, with all with civil society. I hope with all the people who followed this event uh, until now during the lunch breaks. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and lively discussion. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, as Tabea said, there are still lots of open questions. Let's discuss them on social media. If you follow me on, on social media, you will get uh, continuously updates on what's going on in the parliament, within the European Union in terms of legislation and the DSA. So subscribe to my newsletter and you will receive a follow-up email with the link to the recording of this event if there's something you want to go back to. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye and stay healthy. Bye. Thanks Thank to our great speakers. Thank you very, very much. That was very valuable. Thank you so much. Thanks.